All right, I want to draw your attention to verse 17 of Hebrews chapter 6. This right here is just a powerful verse of, uh, passage of Scripture, I believe. But it says, Wherein God willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, which entereth into that within the veil. Okay, now you might not have got the power of that right there because I haven't really gotten to the context of that passage right there and what that is all about and what it's talking about in there. But what I'm going to be preaching about today is I'm going to preach on the subject of once saved, always saved. And that's something that we believe in very strongly here. And that verse right there, we're going to get we're going to get back to that. All right, we're going to look at some other things, and then we're going to kind of look at the context of what we just read there. And when you grasp what that's talking about right there, that passage right there ought to get you really excited. And I believe that is that passage right there is just it's teaching a once saved, always saved. It's teaching us how we can know that we are saved. But look at John chapter ten, verse twenty three. I I believe the doctrine of once saved, always saved is one of the most clear doctrines in the Bible. I don't think there's just there's any room for doubt on this. There's people that want to, you know, they want to question it. There's people out there who teach once saved, always saved today, but they don't teach it was always once saved, always saved. Or they don't teach that, or they, or they teach that, you know, someday you'll be able to lose your salvation, like during the tribulation period, and which is just foolish. Salvation has always been eternal, and it has always been once saved, always saved. Nobody ever has lost their salvation. Nobody ever will lose their salvation. And anybody who thinks that you could lose your salvation, their problem is they just don't understand salvation. They don't understand how to get saved. They are obviously, they are believing in a false gospel. And I personally believe that if somebody does not believe once saved, always saved, it's just because they are not saved. And so let's, let's look at some things on this. But look at John chapter 10, verse 23. It says, and Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. Then came the Jews round about him and said unto him, How long dost thou make us to doubt? If thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you believe me not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But ye believe not, because ye are not of my sheep, as I said unto you. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Okay, so he's saying, the reason you don't know what I'm saying is because you're not my sheep. The reason you're not my sheep is because you don't believe me. Okay? What is it that we teach around here that a person needs to do to be saved? We teach, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. That's what we teach. He's telling these people here, the reason you don't understand this is because you're not my sheep, and you're not my sheep because you don't believe. Okay? And then look what he says here, because this doesn't get any plainer. All right? People are always looking for that verse that just spells it out for them. I mean, that just lays it out plain and clear. And we've got one of them right here. And it says... In verse 28, he says, And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. So right here, he's telling them, listen, I give them eternal life. He doesn't say they earn from me eternal life. They get, you know, he says, I give it to them. And he says, they shall never perish. He says, what I'm giving them is eternal life. Okay? He, does, he, didn't, he almost didn't even need to say, and they shall never perish. If he says, I give unto them eternal life, well, how can you perish if you have eternal life? To perish is to die. And he says, I give unto them eternal life. So he's saying they shall never perish, just emphasizing the fact that this eternal life that they have is actually eternal. It doesn't go away. You can't lose it. They will never perish. He said, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them. There's going to be people that stand before God someday that are going to say, Lord, we've prophesied in your name. In your name, we've cast out devils. and In your name, we've done many wonderful works. And he's going to say to them, depart from me. I never knew you. People who are trying to work their way to heaven, Jesus doesn't know them because they're not saved. You don't get saved by your works. You get saved by believing on Christ. And Jesus said to those who he cast into hell that I never knew you. He didn't say, I used to know you, but I forgot you. He said, I never knew you. And when it comes to those who believe on Christ, Jesus knows us, he knows you, and if he knows you, he was not going to forget you. 
and you will never perish. This is crystal clear. And we could go all over the Bible. And you know what? For the other side, they have a lot of verses that they try to use, and we don't even have time to go into uh, their verses. But folks, all you got to do on every one of them is look at context. And there are no verses that prove you can lose your salvation. Absolutely none. There are zero. There are some, if you take them by themselves, they might sound like it, but most, most of these verses aren't even talking about salvation. And it's just people manipulating the Bible, misusing the Bible. But the reason this doctrine of once saved, always saved is attacked is because if it's not once saved, always saved, then it's a work salvation. Okay? There's people that think, well, you don't have to do any work to get saved, but if you don't do any work, you're not going to stay saved. Then it's work salvation. In Romans chapter 11, verse 6, I like what it says here. It says, and if by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. If it's grace, then it can't, have, it, it can't be works. If it's works, then it can't be grace. The Bible is very clear on that. And you've got people today who sing amazing grace, but then at the same time, they think you have to work your way to heaven. They think you have to be good to go to heaven. I talked to several people yesterday when we were out knocking doors. Asked them if they knew, if they died, if they knew they were going to heaven. They said yes. I asked them how you know. I, some of the people said, because I put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ. I asked them, hey, could you lose your salvation? They said, absolutely not. They were, they were professing Jesus Christ. I believe those people are saved. But then I had another guy. I, he said, yeah, I know. He's like, I know 100% I'm going to heaven. I said, well, hey, how do you know? I was like, how do you know that you're saved? He's like, well, because I, I asked him, I said, what are you trusting in? He's like, well, I'm trusting in the fact that, you know, I've been doing right, you know, for a long time and I go to church and he starts talking about his works. That man was not saved and tried to correct him with the scriptures and he didn't have time for it. And, you know, I hope, I just hope and pray that guy here, you know, gets the gospel to him because unfortunately, uh, he doesn't have it right now. It is not about your works. But this doctrine is one that is con of once saved, always saved. It's constantly attacked. And it's also constantly perverted too. Okay, So for example, a lot of one crowd that gets the credit a lot of times for teaching once saved, always saved are the Calvinists. Okay? Now if you're not real familiar with Calvinism, don't feel bad. They're, you're not missing anything. All right, But we reject Calvinism here. They have their five pillars of Calvinism. And I don't have time to go through them. But all five of their pillars are bad, including the fifth one that is called the perseverance of the saints, or they will also call it once saved, always saved. And what the perseverance of the saints basically teaches is that if you are truly saved, you know, then you will stay saved. Here's the problem with that is what they basically teach. Well, then how do I know I'm saved? Well, if you're really saved, you know, you're going to have the works. So the problem with that, if perseverance of the saints as the Calvinists teach it is true, then I can never know for sure that I'm saved. I can't have that anchor for my soul because I'm always going to have to be looking at, looking within, checking up on my works. I'm going to be like these people that go to the camp meetings every year, listen to these camp meeting preachers that constantly say, now I'm not a Calvinist. They all, they have to say, the camp meeting preachers have to say that all the time. I'm not a Calvinist. If I had a nickel for every time I heard a camp meeting preacher say, now I'm not a Calvinist, you know, I'd probably have about 20 or 30 bucks. But, you know, at the same time, I've heard him say it a lot. Okay? They say that, they make that statement a lot because they sound so much like Calvinists because they teach that if you're saved, you will have the works. Folks, if, that, if our works is the evidence of our salvation, we can never know that we're saved because I don't know what I'm going to do tomorrow. I don't know that I'm going to stay faithful to God. I don't know that. I mean, I hope I do. I hope I endure unto the end. I hope I continue doing right. But I don't know what I'm going to do tomorrow. So how can I know that I'm saved? Okay. The reason we can know we're saved is because it has nothing to do with our works. We're not told to look at our works as proof of our salvation. We're supposed to look at the work of Jesus Christ. And we're going to look back at Hebrews 6 in a little bit and show even more how that's important. But that... That, that Calvinist version of once saved, always saved is, is not once saved, always saved. I mean, you, the whole point of once saved, always saved, that is called eternal security. You cannot have eternal security in, when you believe in this perseverance of the saints garbage. I don't believe in the perseverance of the saints. I believe that saved people can mess up big time. 
I believe that they can get away from God and they can die living in sin. I believe that can happen to a saved person. But you know what? I do believe in the perseverance of Jesus Christ. I believe that Jesus Christ endured the end. I believe he was faithful unto death, even the death of the cross. And you know what? Because my salvation is about his work, because he is a high priest that ever liveth to make intercession for me, I can know for sure that I'm saved. So my salvation, it's not in the perseverance of me, it's in the perseverance of Jesus Christ. He's already done it. He already did it. And therefore, I can know for sure that I'm saved. I've received the gift of eternal life and I can't possibly lose it. It can't be done. So you've got the Calvinists that they teach their counterfeit version of once saved, always saved. But then the Calvinists constantly accuse us of being Arminians, okay? And if you don't know what an Arminian is, an Arminian it, what the, you know, is basically what they'll say is pretty much anybody who's not Calvinist. If you believe in free will, then they'll say that you're an Arminian. And, you know, and we're not gonna take time to go through the different uh, doctrines of the Arminians, but the thing is, the, it, here's a, the Arminians are actually really close in a lot of areas, except for one very important one, and that's once saved, always saved. You know, the Arminians, uh, unfortunately, they are kind of a response to the false doctrine of Calvinism, and it's important that you know we don't, we shouldn't form our doctrine as a response to a false doctrine. We should just state our doctrine clearly from the Bible. This is what it is. But often that happens. They, people, they set up, they, they want to distance themselves from a false doctrine. But you've got to remember the devil sometimes, he likes to get things close. That's how he perverts things. That's how he deceives. And if you get too far away from a false doctrine, sometimes you can end up in another false doctrine. And I think that's what happens with the Arminians. But in the Arminians, they have their five pillars that are all kind of in response to the Calvinists. Uh, pillars that they have. But the last one, I, I'm not going to read through their other ones. I actually basically agree with their other ones. But in the last one, they say believers are able to resist sin through grace and Christ will keep them from falling. But whether they are beyond the possibility of ultimately forsaking God or becoming devoid of grace must be particularly determined from the scriptures. So this one particular statement I found in the pillars of Arminianism it doesn't really make a stand. It just like, you're going to have to look at the scriptures to figure out if you can lose your salvation. It takes a really weak stand. I found another one that it's clearly a response. They have instead of, um, well, so I, I, I don't want to take, if I get on these, I'm going to start talking about all of them. I don't want to do that. But the last one they have is fall from grace that they say. Uh, and it says the teaching that a person can fall from grace and lose his salvation. That, and that's in response to perseverance of the saints. You know, because perseverance of the saints, that's that once saved, always saved. Well, the Arminians, in their response to that, they're like, uh, yeah, actually, you can lose your salvation. Folks, that's wrong. This is why we're not Calvinists or Arminians, okay? We are just Bible believers. We do not believe that you can lose your salvation. And so even when it comes to once saved, always saved, or when it comes to you know, people that responded to the false doctrine of Calvinism. It's just amazing how they got all these other things right. But if you lose the once saved, always saved, the eternal security, then who cares about the rest of your doctrine? It proves once again that even the Arminians don't understand salvation. It proves that even Arminians have the wrong gospel. Therefore, we're not going to associate ourselves with that. We're not going to call ourselves Arminians. They are clearly wrong. Once saved, always saved. It has to be true. And I'm just going to give you a few reasons. This is really simple stuff, but I think it's important that we understand these things because people aren't getting it. It, it is so clear that people do not get this. You can go to Baptist churches and it's, it's clear people don't get this. When we're out souling, we can talk to other people who profess to be Baptist, but they think you can lose your salvation. You've got the camp meeting Baptist that... They don't believe you can lose your salvation, but the problem with them, they can't ever figure out if they are saved. That's their, that's their problem. They can't ever figure out if they're saved or not. And it's because, uh, you know, unfortunately, a lot of them have accepted a false gospel. But if people could grasp once saved, always saved in its true, pure, biblical form, it would give them that anchor for the soul. It would give them that assurance. It would give them the confidence to go out and 
present the gospel to people and be a witness, these people wouldn't have to sit around trying to figure out if they're saved all the time. Every time they go and they hear a message about hell, have to come up to an altar again and get saved again, you know, like, like that's even possible. They, if they understood this in this biblical form, the joy and the peace that it would bring, I don't know, it might just become a well of water springing up in everlasting life. It might just make them want to just start telling other people like the woman at the well did. That's probably what would happen. And so look, just a few reasons why once saved, always saved has to be true. First off, once saved, always saved, it's the only way to keep boasting excluded. Okay? Look what it says in Romans chapter 3. And we'll start reading in verse, in verse 21. See, I, I can't tell you how sick it makes me when I hear somebody, one, when you ask them how they know they're saved and they start talking about their works, it makes me sick for a couple reasons. It's like, one, you know, just how good do you think you are, scumbag? You know, that, that, that's, what, that's one thought that crosses my mind. But then, two, I, you know, I try to be merciful. I try to look at things better. I just think, you know, how deceived this person is. You know, and unfortunately, that's where most people are. They are just deceived. They know way too little about salvation. But it says in Romans 3.21, it says, But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested being witnessed by the law and the prophets even the righteousness of god which is by faith of jesus christ unto all and upon all them that believe for there is no difference for all have sinned and come short of the glory of god now we all know that verse right there but look what it was saying before it's saying that the righteousness of god this righteousness that we need in order to be saved, we need his righteousness, it comes without the law. We don't get it from the law, folks. We don't get righteousness from keeping the law. That's what it's saying right there. And he said this righteousness, it was manifested. It was witnessed by the law and the prophets. They prophesied of this in the Old Testament. You can see this clear in the Old Testament. I mean, David himself says, blessed is the man to whom the Lord imputeth not sin. David preached about this righteousness. And so in verse 22, it says, Even the righteousness of God, which is by the faith of Jesus Christ, it's on all them who believe, the Bible says. And that we've been teaching, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And why did he say that? He's, the reason he says for all have sinned is because of the fact that there was no difference between Jew and Greek. You had the Greeks that were the wicked reprobates that we read about in Romans chapter 1, but then you have the Jews that weren't as bad as the Greeks in Romans chapter 2, but you know what in, in Romans chapter 3 he's saying, but you know what at the end of the day, there is no difference because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Yeah, you know what? Most of you in here, you probably never killed anybody. You know, you never went and, uh, you know, you might not have done some of these horrible things that others done. Maybe you never committed adultery and things like that, but you know what? There's no difference between you and the Greeks you and the reprobates at the end of the day because of the fact you've all sinned. And so you know what? If you're a sinner, you deserve to die and go to hell. And that, that's what he's teaching right there. But this righteousness that we are looking for, it doesn't come from the law. It comes from believing on Christ. So verse four, 24, being justified freely. Okay? Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Do y'all see that, folks? He is just. And he is the justifier of him that starts going to church, that gets baptized, that repents of his sins, no, but of him, he's the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. That's what it says. And so in verse 27, look what it says. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Now, folks, does it get any clearer than that right there? Does it get any clearer that our salvation is based on our faith in Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross? The fact that he died, was buried, and rose again. He shed his blood as payment for our sins. 
We are believing in that and we do it without works. It's without the deeds of the law. Therefore, we are unable to boast. And everybody knows Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, for it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So folks, listen, while a lot of people would agree that you have that there no works get you saved, but if you don't do the works, you're not really saved or you're not going to stay saved, well then, if I'm still saved, then I have reason to boast, don't I? You know, if I get saved, Brother Aaron gets saved, but then I go to heaven, Brother Aaron doesn't go to heaven, he didn't endure to the end. I did. You know, he didn't maintain his faith. I did. Do you all see how, you see, that's exactly what would happen. Oh, well, in heaven, we're going to be too humble to do that. No, it's saying there's, there's no reason for it. There is, there, there is nothing that we can boast about that is excluded. And so if, there, if it's possible for us to lose our salvation, then we could brag that we didn't lose our salvation. But folks, you can't lose your salvation, so none of us get to brag. Hey, how, did you get, how, do, how do you know you're going to heaven? Or when we're in heaven, let's say we're just in heaven one day having a conversation. Hey, how'd you get here? I trusted in Jesus Christ. Really? That's what I did too. How'd you keep it? Well, Jesus stayed faithful to the end. Same thing with me. What do we get to brag about? You know what we're going to be left doing? Praising the Lord. We're going to be left praising Him. And that's why we're going to be singing, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain in heaven. Why? Because none of us are going to have a reason to pat ourselves on the back or praise ourselves. We're only going to be able to glorify God. And if salvation has, if works are involved in any way, shape, or form, then we have reason to praise ourselves. If we can, if our keeping our salvation is based on our works, then we could praise ourselves, but it's not. It has nothing to do with that. And so once saved, always saved has to be true. Otherwise, there could be boasting. Another reason once saved, always saved has to be true. It's the only way for the gift to be truly free. Look what it says in Romans chapter 5 and verse 15. Now, we ought to understand this better than anybody. We all know better than, you know, when you go to Walmart or you go to any store, if you see something that says free, you, you don't get excited, do you? All right. No, how many gets excited when you get like a, an offer in the mail and it says, you know, free whatever? You, you get excited? I don't get excited when I see that. And you know what? Unfortunately, because of stinking, corrupt, lying, stealing marketers, people don't get excited when we come to their house and tell them about a free gift of salvation. Y'all think the devil might have had something to do with that right there? Because, folks, I'm here today to tell you, when we say free and when the Bible says free, it actually means free. It doesn't mean, you know, no money down, pay later. No, it means free. There, it means no strings attached. And there actually are no strings attached. How many gets excited when you see an ad and it says no strings attached? I don't. Okay. And unfortunately, a lot of people don't get excited when they see our tracks too that teach that. Why? Because they've been lied to so many times. And you know what? We just got we just got to keep telling them the truth. But it's actually free in the Bible. Look what it says in Romans five verse fifteen. It says, "But not as uh, not as the offense." so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, and much more the grace of God, and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation. But the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Therefore, by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, folks, how can you read that passage in there and think you got to work for it somehow? Did you see how many times it said gift, free gift? 
It just kept saying it over and over again and just emphasizing how free this gift is. And he makes it at the end. He said, well, we're sending about. Well, what about people that are really bad? Okay. I, I understand it's free. Okay, fine. I understand that it's free, but what about this person that's just really bad? Well, we're sin did abound, grace did much more abound. It works for them too. That's what, it's, that's what it's teaching right there. Why? Because that grace that reigns through righteousness unto eternal life is not by our works, but it is by Jesus Christ. And so folks, the only way salvation can truly be free is if it's once saved, always saved. That Because if I get saved and then I've got to start doing works to keep that salvation, it wasn't free, was it? Just like all those things that you get at Best Buy that says free today, okay, when you're making those payments later, it proves it wasn't really free, was it? They didn't just give you that. Okay? When you're making payments, it's because it wasn't free. We do not have to make payments to keep our salvation or to maintain our salvation. It's free. It was given to us. It's ours. You say, well, you could give it back. Not eternal life. When you take something that's eternal, okay, that, that is something that's forever. Okay? We have it. Okay? If you have eternal life. Now, there's some things I can have today and I can not have tomorrow. I can have a car today, but I could not have that car tomorrow. You know why? Because cars aren't eternal. Okay? But eternal life, it, it's, it's eternal. You either have it or you don't have it. And if you have it, you will always have it because it's eternal. Eternity goes on forever and ever. You cannot lose something like that. And if, and if you could lose it, then what would make you lose it? It would obviously have to be works, right? Then that, be, that would mean, well, boasting is back on the table. I could potentially boast. So salvation... Once saved, always saved. It has to be true because it's the only way for the gift to truly be free. Also, it is the only way for promises to be fulfilled. Now, let's go back to Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 6. When preaching on the subject of once saved, always saved, really the challenge is what part of the Bible do I focus on? You know, what passages on this subject do I focus on? Because, because there are so many. But we'll, let's start reading in verse 13. Of Hebrews chapter 6 all right because because I, I love this right here because here this is the key too. you know is knowing that we're saved all right no Bible teaches that we can know that we're saved and I try to tell people this all the time if our works are any factor in our salvation all that we cannot know we're saved if our works are a factor in any way of keeping our salvation we cannot possibly know that we're saved, but we can know we're saved. The Bible emphasizes that over and over again. But let's look what it says in verse 13. It says, For when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely blessing I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thee. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men verily swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife. So notice how he says, people they normally they swear by the greater. Well, you know what? There is no greater than God, is there? So he's got to swear by himself. Okay. And when it comes to the promise that he gave to Abraham of multiplying his seed, God went and he swore by himself. Okay. Now, how many of you before have ever made a promise? you know, for someone else, and then they didn't come through, okay? Like, listen, maybe, uh, now, I, I've, I've done that before where I've worked jobs and sales and things, and uh, I told them, hey, you know, talk to the boss. He said the job's going to be done at this time. And then the boss didn't get the job done at that time. And then I feel like an idiot later when the people are calling me. If you said, uh, you know, you're a liar. I was like, well... I thought I was telling the truth, you know, but the truth is this person that I, I swore by, they let me down. Okay. And off, and I'm, I'm very careful with that. Okay. I try not to promise on behalf of other people because I don't always know what other people are going to do. Okay. And when it comes to our salvation, you know, God did not swear by any of us because who knows what we're going to do. And we definitely, we can't, we can't trust ourselves. 
Okay? But God, he cannot lie. We're going to see that here in a second. When it came to the promise to Abraham, he swore by himself. Because he can guarantee what he's going to do. Showing here that, you know, if God just controls us like we're robots, then why didn't God just go ahead and swear by us? He could just make us do the right thing, couldn't he? But no, we actually do have free will. We can mess up big time if we're not careful. And, you know, it is, it's a very hard thing to promise something that someone else will do. Okay? And so, and it's even hard for us to do that with ourselves. You know, I've made promises before, and then sometimes, sometimes I just forget things. Sometimes I tell people I'm going to do something, and I just forget, all right? I remember, y'all remember when the chambers were here? I remember I told Brother TC I was going to help them move. I told me and the boys were going to help you move. And I just completely forgot. The, the day came to help move, and I just I completely forgot. I went, and I, I went in and I worked at Walmart that day. I, to, I just I totally forgot. And I remember I'm leaving work, and all of a sudden I looked on my phone and I had a voicemail from them. And I, man, I, I mean, I just, I felt, I, as soon as I saw the voicemail, I realized what I had done. And I felt so bad, but I'll never forget it. I went and I listened to that voicemail, and he was calling to let me know that he didn't need me to come help. And I was just, oh. <laughs> I, I, thank goodness they had gotten it all done the night before. And I mean, because I did, I felt terrible. And I did not intend to do that. I intended to do the right thing, but I just forgot. I just messed up. And we often do that. And if it, when it comes to our salvation, we could have the best intentions in the world of being good and trying to do the right thing, but we never know what we're going to do. And we definitely don't know what other people are going to do. But you know what? When it comes to the promises that God gave to us, God never swore by anybody else other than himself. Why? Let's keep reading in verse 18. That by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. So we see that, that we, there's something we know here. God can't lie. It's impossible for God to lie. So he swore by himself. The promises of eternal life, those promises are based on the work of Jesus Christ. They're not based on what we do. And because they are based on the work of Jesus Christ, we can know we're saved. We can have that anchor for the soul and we can flee to refuge because once again, I don't know what I'm going to do. And often I talk to people when I knock on their door and I ask them if they know they're saved. Well, I'm not real sure. And a lot of these people, they're actually trying. They're going to church, but you know what? They're always like, you know, I, I don't know for sure because I don't know what I'm going to do. And many of the, the people who have that attitude, they're usually excited to find out, well, guess what? It's not based on what you do. It's not based on you continuing you know, to do the right thing. It's at, you can actually get it settled right here, right now, by just by faith, accepting the free gift of salvation. And what we do is we try to teach people that this salvation that you have, it's based 100% on what Jesus Christ did, not what you do. And then you know what we do? We flee to him for refuge. We run to him for refuge. And it says in verse 19, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, which entereth into that within the veil for whether the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And Folks, I, I could preach a whole other message just on that verse right there. The high priest in the Old Testament, he would do things on behalf of the people. He would give offerings for sin on behalf of the people. He would do work on behalf of the people to keep them right with God. But you know what? Those high priests, you know, they all had flaws. They had their problems. You know, they weren't always sure what that high priest was going to do. Some of the high priests they had were bad guys. And they, they didn't do a good job. But you know what? God provided a better high priest, and his name is Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ, he's never going to mess up. He's always going to do the right thing. He ever liveth to make intercession for us. He's a high, the high priest, they only stayed the high priest until they died. Well, Jesus Christ, he's going to live forever. 
He's always our high priest. And so because of that, we are all, we're able to just rest and have confidence that, you know what, our high priest is going to do things right. Our high priest already did things right. He doesn't have to go into the veil every year. He went and he shed his blood on the cross once and for all. He already did the work. And because he ever liveth, because he's going to live forever, our salvation is, is, is secure forever. We are going to live just as long as Jesus lives. That, that's how long we are going to live, as long as Jesus lives. And when we understand that, we see that once saved, always saved has to be true because it's the only way the promise can be fulfilled. He's made a promise of eternal life to us. Well, if that eternal life is somehow based on what we do, then we could mess up God's promise, couldn't we? Just like other people have messed up our promises. God has promised us that we will go to heaven. God promised us that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's what he promised. So if I call on the Lord and then I mess up and I lose my, sal lose my salvation, then you know what? I made God a liar when he said, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But you know what? Since salvation is not based on my works, therefore God is able to keep his promise. And I, I can't mess that up. I can't make God look bad in that sense. And so the last reason, we've already went through the verses for it, once saved, always saved has to be true because it is the only way we can know we're saved. That's why we can stand here today and we can confidently say, confidently say with full assurance that if I died right now, I know I would go to heaven. Why? Because... Jesus is still living. He's still on the throne. All I did was I just believed on him. That's, that's all I did. And I'm good. I'm secured. I'm, I'm going to spend eternity in heaven. And so uh, right now, what do we do? So what do we do right now? All right, we're saved. Well, we're not, we're not going to take time to go through all of Titus chapter 2. But Titus chapter 2, uh, it has a very famous verse in there. In verse 11, where it says, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. Everybody knows that when they like to use that verse to prove an imminent rapture. But the thing is, we're not, that's not teaching us to look for an imminent rapture. If you read all of chapter 2, it's teaching sound doctrine, and it's all about behavior. It's all about how we behave ourselves. It's all about what we, it's all about what we do. And the truth is, we mess up a lot, don't we? Okay? I mean, we're not, well, you know, a lot of times we like to talk like we're, we're not really that much like Christ, are we? Are any of us holy in here? Have any of us gone five hours without sinning? You know, unless sleep counts, but I, you know, I, but we, we haven't done that. All right. But you know what? We're looking for that righteousness. We're looking to be able to do all these things that we've been commanded to do in Titus chapter two and in the rest of the Bible. And in the meantime, while we're, like, we fail all the time, one of these days, we will be like Christ when he appears, when he returns. And that is our hope. Our hope of salvation, it's not just the fact that we're going to go to heaven, but it's that we will be righteous and like Christ one day. That's a part of the hope, that we will be like Christ one day. You know, the pre-trib crowd, for them, the hope is just us getting out of here. But no, the real blessed hope is that we will be like Christ someday. And that just happens to take place at his return. When we see him, we're going to be like him. And so it says in verse 11, it says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us to denying ungodliness and worldly lust. We should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope. We're supposed to be trying to be like Christ right now. Okay, We're shooting for it even though we're not there, but we're looking for it. And when does it come? It comes when we see Jesus Christ. It says in 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. Okay, We ain't there yet, folks. And don't sit there looking like you are there. You're not there yet. It doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Okay? And then look at this. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. You know why we try to be righteous? 
Because we have the hope that we are going to be righteous one of these days. That's why we try. It's not because we think we are. It's because we know we're going to be one of these days. And so we're going to see, we're going to see if we can't just be a little bit more like him right now. You know, and I think, uh, I, th I think a good way to illustrate it too, you know, is if a, if a woman who is engaged to a man, right? If, if, a, if a woman is engaged to a man, she's not married to that man, is she? She's just engaged. Okay? So is it okay for her to date other guys during that time? No. She's, but she's not married to that guy. He doesn't own her yet. Right? You know, you know, he doesn't that so what why can't she go and be dating other guys? You know why? Because she has been promised, she has promised herself to this other guy. So you know what she should start doing is she should start, you know, remaining faithful to him while she can. You know, she needs to separate herself from other men. And the same thing for the guy. He should he should do the same thing. Why? Because they know that. At the end of the day, what's eventually going to happen, those two are going to be together. There's no need to date other people. What's going to happen, we're going to be together. Eventually, we are going to be married, and we're going to live the rest of our lives being faithful only to each other. So we might as well start practicing some of these things right now. And you know what? We are not righteous like Christ yet, but we're going to be one of these days. So you know, last thing we need to be doing is going and messing around in sin, getting caught up in all kinds of sin. That's the last thing we need to do. If we have that hope in us, we ought to start living like it the best we can right now. Right now, we ought to start doing these things. And we're going to do that until the day comes where all of a sudden we're like Christ. But in the meantime, whatever happens, I'm going to heaven. I'm saved. Nothing can change that. If I, but I, I ought to try to be better. I ought to try to be like Christ. It'll help me have a better testimony. It'll help me have a better life on this earth. You know, I ought to do it for all those reasons. But my salvation is secure. If you're saved today, your salvation is secure. You're never going to lose it. If you leave here today and you get run over by a semi, you're going to heaven. You will be in heaven. Nothing can change that. Even if you just cussed a guy out that, you know, cut you off. You know, right before that. You know, I almost got road rage this week. Somebody cut me off. I mean, that close to hit me, I almost, I almost followed him. I, I, and I stopped myself. I, 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 almost, I almost followed him. I, I didn't. And it wasn't so I could keep my salvation. Uh, it was so I could keep my testimony. And maybe keep my life. I don't know. They might have been packing or something. I don't know. But, but anyway. Anyway, I, I, I'm secure on that end. But I, I'm not secure from judgment on this earth either. And so I better watch it. So anyway, with that, let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you, Lord, for the promise of salvation. We thank you that the promise is fulfilled by you and your work and not what we do. And we thank you that we can have that security and we can have that assurance of knowing that we do not have to worry about that horrible place called hell. I pray you'll help us to just... Uh, rejoice in that and help us to tell others. In your name we pray. Amen. Let's